Hello, everyone. Lori White with the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce welcome you to another edition of Chamber TV. This is episode number 176. And uh, very excited today to welcome a very special guest, Dr. Mukesh Jain. And Dr. Jain is the new Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown University School of Medicine. So pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Jane to the program today. So much to talk about with him. Uh, everything ranging from the new uh, medical school anniversary, 50 years with the medical school. Uh, so much impact there to unpack. And we have a very special video presentation that we are going to present. Uh, in addition to great new plans for the Jewelry District for a series of integrated academic medical center and laboratory space to pursue cutting edge research. So with that as an introduction, I want to formally welcome uh, an esteemed physician scientist, Dr. Mukesh Jain. How are you today? Great to be with you, Lori. Thanks so much for having me and I am great. Fantastic. So uh, tell us a little bit where you are. I see you uh, ensconced in a, uh, a very esoteric uh, medical <laughs> school laboratory. Uh, where are you? Uh, where are you coming to us from uh, today? Yeah, we're, we're actually in the Warren Alpert uh, Medical School, one of the classrooms in the medical school. And you can see behind me, I don't know if, the, if you or the audience will be able to read it, but uh, clearly one of our faculty members is teaching the students about cardiovascular physiology, which is very close to my heart, no pun intended, uh, but I'm a cardiologist, so we thought it'd be a great background uh, backdrop for this conversation. So you are not only a cardiologist, you are a highly acclaimed researcher as well, and you are coming to Brown University from an illustrious career in Cleveland. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I, um, I'll just tell you, I grew up in upstate New York then spent about 15 years in Boston for a lot of my medical training. I was on faculty at the Brigham Women's Hospital for several years before moving to Cleveland, where I've been, as you, as you noted, for the last 15 years. And in Cleveland, I had a, a number of roles that spanned from starting basic research institutes, clinical research efforts, uh, clinical operations, uh, a more entrepreneurial effort. And then finally, uh, in the last five, six years, I oversaw research and education between Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals of Cleveland. So worked really at the interface of both the university and the health system. You have uh, a great um, uh, career and skill set, integrated skill set to be able to bring uh, a new thrust a new emphasis to the role of Dean at the medical school at Brown University. So what uh, what initially attracted you to Brown and to Rhode Island? Yeah, so I, I would say a few things. One is the, the really amazing leadership that the university has. Uh, President Paxson, Provost Locke, just remarkable leaders who had a very bold vision to integrate academics across the, the, the ecosystem. And that's something, as I've mentioned, I had a little bit of experience in Cleveland. So I thought I could bring something uh, to the table. The excellence of the faculty and students was a second uh, issue that was really, really important. And then finally, you know, Brown and Providence, Rhode Island have, have a lovely sense. Uh, there's a sense of warmth, a sense of community uh, and again, that that I feel it at the university, I feel it throughout the community. And now having been here about six months, you know, the experiences have confirmed those initial impressions that I had. So I would say those are some of the key reasons that attracted me to the opportunity here. We had an opportunity to meet um, Dr. Jane a couple of months ago on the campus of Brown University. It was really exciting to be able to get to speak with you directly about some of your plans for the program. And uh, most importantly, to spend a couple of minutes just uh, reflecting on the treasure that is the medical school at Brown University. So uh, I have to point out that uh, I see that you are wearing a very special pin 
which uh, which really calls attention to uh, to the 50 year anniversary. So uh, hard to believe that it has been uh, that milestone. So uh, thoughts on you know what you see modern day medicine looking like compared to you know perhaps what we may have been accustomed to 20 or 30 years ago when you know it seems like um, a lot of the things that we're talking about today were really in the infancy. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just take a moment, if it's okay, just to share with the audience. You know, it is the 50 years, and that's what this pin, as you pointed out, reflects. So it's a really, uh, a really important milestone year for the medical school that began as a program, and how now Lori has evolved into one of the leading medical schools in the nation. You know, we have 2,500 faculty, 2,000 trainees, all the way from undergraduate to uh, residents and fellows in the hospital systems. Uh, and, and over the years, the contributions of the medical school have ranged from discoveries that have changed uh, how we take care of patients, training a generation, uh, more than a generation now, of medical students that now are physicians across the land and globe, uh, and, and have trained real leaders, some of them uh, that lead the National Institutes of Health or, or other major academic medical centers across the land and globe. So that, that is uh, the contribution of the medical school over 50 years um, to both within the state and broadly. But, but as you point out, health is changing. And I think some of the changes that are occurring are, um, you know, back when I trained, we focused a lot on inpatient. And one of the really big changes that is occurring is that patients want to be taken care of where they are, where it's easy for them to be seen. And so there is a movement from the inpatient to the ambulatory setting to the home setting. And that has really important implications for the medical school and our colleagues in the health system, how we take care of patients. Uh, and, and our medical students need to be trained not just as I was more on the, you know, in the hospital and the acute setting, but also in the outpatient setting and in the home setting. Um, I would say that is one of really the most dramatic changes. The other thing that I think over time we've become incredibly uh, more uh, attuned to is the importance of equitable access to affordable health care. And that is something that we as a nation, I think, are paying a lot more attention to that historically we probably have not. And that's an important area that the medical school will focus on in training, be it at the student level or at the resident uh, and, and faculty level. So just to put this in perspective, I know we do have um, a really well-produced uh, video. It's about a minute long, minute and a half. So perhaps um, with your permission, Dr. Jane, we'll take uh, just a few moments and we will take a look at the, uh, the history of the medical school and then on the other side, talk a little bit about um, some of the key aspects that we'll be celebrating over the course of the next year. So let's look at the video. Great. For 50 years, Brown University physician scientists have been addressing complex health problems from the first students who helped design the program in medicine to the Warren Albert Medical School's most recent graduates. Medical school alumni have committed themselves to lives of service around the world. Brown medical students and faculty also serve local communities, providing care wherever they are needed. They are driven by the belief that physicians should have an understanding of the broadest aspects of human experience. Every day, in labs and teaching hospitals, faculty seek treatments and cures that will define the next 50 years of medicine at Brown. Developing a vaccine for malaria. Finding ways to prevent Alzheimer's. Discovering new cancer therapies. Understanding addiction. Confronting health disparities and racism in medicine. And preparing a new generation of doctors. At the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University, our faculty, students, staff, and alumni have been changing the world for 50 years, and we aren't done yet. Indeed, uh, not done yet. In fact, just uh, just beginning. 50 years is is probably pretty young for a medical school, isn't it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So we we're, that's why we're not done yet. We have a long way to go, Lori, but uh, absolutely, there are some medical schools that are several hundred years old, um, but uh, 
but uh, yeah, our, our, our medical school is younger, but we've, we've done a lot of work in 50 years to become one of the preeminent institutions in the nation. I think uh, and if I could just put some context around this, that uh, those of us in Rhode Island, we probably have not, not encountered a situation where we've been either to a physician's office or a hospital or some kind of research setting where we have not encountered uh, skilled practitioners from Brown University School of Medicine. And uh, I would point out that I know that it's really comforting for me, at least, you know, when I'm in a hospital setting to know that that hospital is part of a teaching hospital, a teaching hospital network where the practitioners, where the students are really learning cutting edge treatments and behaviors and modalities. Uh, so the notion of a, of a teaching hospital is, is really quite an asset for a community. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think you've hit the highlights. Uh, you know, look, teaching hospitals uh, have been really the, 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 the centerpiece of several things. One is d providing cutting edge care to patients of all walks of life, particularly the most marginalized citizens amongst us. Um, they are the center, they're central, I should say, to research and innovation so that we not only deliver great care, but we make discoveries that advance the standard of care for tomorrow. And then we, of course, train the next generation. So they are a vital part of the ecosystem of, of any community and certainly within this nation uh, have been central to the successes and the health advances that we've all enjoyed. Curious to know if um, you've detected any differences uh, in the applicant pool for students that are looking to become physicians. Uh, is there any sense that um, the profession has changed and it's drawing a different kind of applicant or what, are, yeah. what is your sense of that? It's a great question, you know, and, and I'll sort of contrast it to when I applied uh, medical school admissions at that time and the type of applicant, applicant were often much more focused on science, engineering, and research. And those were the qualifications that allowed you to get into medical school. I think we do a much more holistic view of individuals today. And the individuals that are coming into medical school come from all backgrounds, meaning they might have been, they might have majored in the humanities. Many, many students today have lived experiences, meaning they took time off to do something other than you know, proceeding straight to medical school, but have lived experiences that enrich them. And then at some point they decided, you know, I really wanna go to medical school. This is what I wanna do. So the students tend to be a little bit older, probably on the order of a couple years older than when I applied, but they have a different perspective, a much more holistic and better understanding of life uh, outside of, of, you know, collegiate or universities. And that I think only enriches uh, the experience uh, that they have in medical school. And it seems that there are um, other disciplines that have opened up in the medical field, um, particularly nurse, practic nurse practitioners and also uh, physician assistant. And those fields and those professions and the introduction of you know, that way of intersecting with the medical community, no doubt has broadened the appeal of um, treating patients from a holistic healthcare perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it, there's been an enormous growth in nurse practitioners, in PAs, and that has allowed us to have many more touch points with the patient, both within the hospital, but particularly in the outpatient, uh, i.e. ambulatory or or home setting. And we, we all understand how important that those contact points are with healthcare providers. And it wouldn't be something that physicians alone could do. So having an entire health system team that's coordinated and caring, uh, I think has, is an important advance and improves uh, the outcome for patients. You mentioned um, in the video, the, the focus on addiction and mental health and some of those issues that, you know, perhaps a generation ago didn't play as prominent a role in the holistic health of an individual. 
Um, what are your views on that? And how does today's cohort of physicians really think about uh, mental health as a precursor to any, any sort of um, diseases that present in, in very difficult ways? Yeah, thanks for that question. Really, really important. And I think, again, c contrasting it to uh, a previous generation when I might have trained, we didn't spend as much time or focus on mental health, behavioral health. And we now know, and certainly, you know, we um, you just look at the daily news and, and you have an appreciation of how important mental health is and how it impacts all aspects of society. I think we've also started to break down the barrier, that taboo that was associated with mental health. Not completely, I still think we have a ways to go, but it is much better we as a society, not just in the medical profession, but as a society recognize and embrace that that is something that is important and that we have to tackle as a, as a community, as a society. Um, so I, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. It is a vital part of uh, overall health, mental health. It should not be a taboo. It is a challenge like other health challenges and, and it needs to be treated that way. And I'm very proud of, of uh, shamelessly a, a personal plug. My daughter is training in psychiatry, Lori, and I couldn't be prouder because of course I'm biased, she's super bright, but, uh, but she's going to make a difference and it's something that she's really passionate about. And we need people that have passion to help the mental health challenges that we have broadly across society. Well, uh, congratulations to you and your daughter, and uh, we certainly need talented and compassionate individuals to enter the field, particularly around the mental health space and psychiatry. And, you know, you point out, um, you know, you said it's, it's not taboo, but perhaps um, for some people that have, uh, that are experiencing mental health issues or have family members that are experiencing mental health issues, it, it is a little bit difficult to, to talk about, to confront, to come to grips with. What have you seen as some of the changing faces or forces that have allowed people to, to open up and what, what do people need to do, what do families need to do to really understand that it is not taboo anymore? In fact, it's, it's incredibly common. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and, and I'll, you know, without uh, too much, getting too much in the deep in detail, but I think every family has mental health issues that they've dealt with, right? It's it's not. Um, I, I certainly have seen it in my own family, uh, an extended family, and so I, I really understand. Uh, at times, it can leave one with a very a sense of helplessness, if you will. And so, what I would say to families that are experiencing it is certainly the medical profession. Uh, be it at the medical school or in the health systems or primary care provider. I think what you'll find today is that um, healthcare workers, physicians, um, but anyone uh, in, in, in the healthcare space is going to be very, very open to having conversations. And if they can't directly help you, they can connect you to people that can help you or resources that can help you. But you've got to take the first step and reach out and ask for help. And I think today versus again, 30, 50 years ago, the response is very, very different. I know that um, in terms of your background, your expertise and what you're looking at for the future direction of the medical school, some of the areas of uh, research and inquiry, in addition to mental health um, surround issues of of aging and memory and diseases of the brain. Again, I know that this is uh, something that is definitely ubiquitous, ubiquitous among all of our, among all of our families. But I think it's reassuring uh, for people to know that we have resources here locally, and we have professionals here locally that are engaged in cutting edge, re cutting edge research uh, relative to diseases of the brain. Absolutely. So one of the great strengths of Brown in our community is in the brain health space broadly. We have one of the premier psychiatry departments in the nation. Uh, and we have research that goes all the way from the laboratory to the population in, in brain health, be it 
early problems, for example, neurodevelopmental problems that occur in children, all the way to Alzheimer's disease, real deep expertise in those spaces. And then we've got a, a whole group of individuals who are trying to understand this uh, at, the, at the laboratory level, at the clinical level, uh, at the patient level, and at the population level. But it's one of the great strengths of our community is brain health broadly. Uh, again, be it from childhood to in the uh, setting of aging, like dementia, and and uh, behavioral and psychiatric challenges as well. Yeah. So, what are, what are some of the cutting edge treatments that you are working on, you and your team at Brown, that would help to obviate some of these, you know, really distressing conditions? Yeah. So, some of the work that we're involved in is really. Uh, I'll just take one example in the Alzheimer space, where our investigators have identified new targets that they are now developing drugs to, to try to affect the outcome. So one of, one of the, the big areas uh, push for us is obviously in Alzheimer's. And that's just an example of new biology and new therapeutics to take on obviously one of the great unmet health challenges of today. The, um, the new research facilities and integrated labs uh, that have just been announced uh, by Brown University uh, in terms of new investment in the jewelry district and um, great more capacity for, for research into some of these uh, areas of very you know, stubborn diseases. So let's uh, transition uh, a little bit to that and talk about um, a couple of things around the, the, new, uh, the new proposed investment. Very exciting, certainly a huge economic impact that we can um, expect in the jewelry district in Providence with this, this vision of a whole new center for integrated life sciences research. So um, really excited to learn a little bit more about that and how, you know, how that can sort of play out in the day-to-day -day experience of a patient. Yeah, so the, the, the new uh, integrated life sciences building really at, a, at sort of a 10,000 foot level, I would say, Lori, the goal is really to try to take on some of the great unmet health challenges of today that affect our community and frankly, beyond our community. So some of the areas that we're going to be focusing on, you've touched on uh, one already, aging and age associated disorders like dementia, cancer. So that's one major focus. Uh, the other is in, in, um, in something that is not necessarily in our backyard, but affects citizens across the land and particularly the globe, uh, which is infectious disease. We're all familiar with the pandemic, but there are other diseases like malaria and schistosomiasis, um, which are not necessarily in our backyard, but they affect millions of people lead to incredible death and disability across the globe. And as, as citizens of the globe, we have a responsibility to try to help the most marginalized amongst us across the globe. And so the, the areas within infectious disease, aging and age associated disorders are two of the major components of, of this new building. Our hope is to leverage those insights that, that our physicians and scientists will, will provide to develop new drugs, devices, and diagnostics. And you touched on this a little bit, and I'll just expand on it. We also envision that this building, because it'll, it'll be quite a robust uh, effort, will have real economic benefit for our community in terms of research jobs, be it faculty, staff, trainees that, that participate in research activities. We also would anticipate and are working hard to try to attract biotech and biopharma uh, to, to the area. Of course, those, that brings great jobs as well. And I think in doing this, we're going to have an impact on health. That's ultimately the most important uh, goal, but we will also have an economic impact for our community and a reputational impact. You know, if we're able to achieve this, people will start to think about not just Brown Providence, but the entire state of Rhode Island uh, as a place that you have great advances in life sciences and and it's uh, it's uh, committed 
to not only the science, but also bringing that science to fruition in partnership with industry. Fantastic. So we are talking to Dr. Mukesh Jain. He is the new Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown University. We are talking about all things uh, School of Medicine at Brown, 50th anniversary of the medical school, uh, Dr. Jane's uh, recent uh, recruitment into Rhode Island. We haven't talked about your favorite restaurants yet, Dr. <laughs> Jane. Uh, maybe we can uh, spend a few minutes before we go uh, talking about your first impressions of living here in Rhode Island. But for now, what we're doing is uh, we are thinking through and reimagining um, the role of the medical school in uh, population health, public health, uh, uh, infectious diseases, cancer, uh, diseases of the brain, and um, thinking about what the new profile of the medical school is going to look like in the jewelry district, uh, certainly off campus and on campus. So um, the announcement was made just a few weeks ago. We were very excited to, um, to be part of that. We remember uh, when the announcements were made to construct the medical school building right off of Richmond. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, are, we are making uh, considerable progress in filling out uh, what we like to call the knowledge district um, with uh, life sciences and entrepreneurs and researchers and scientists and, and folks that are funders and students and you know a, just a, a wide assortment of professional service providers. So. Let's um, reimagine, if you will, uh, Dr. Jane, what what you imagine the that particular part of the city will look like in five to six years when um, when this new development has um, has really taken shape. Yeah, so I I would look at it. Um, you know, what would be my sort of dream goal would be something that looks like a, a Kendall Square. You know, some of the great. Uh, areas, um, that's the one that we often use as an exemplar or as a gold standard, where you have science, uh, engineering is an important part of the vision uh, for this new building. So science and engineering efforts, which lead to new insights that will be advanced by biotech and biopharma that reside in proximity to where the science is being done. And, and that will serve as an economic engine for, for the Julia district and frankly, the entire state with jobs that are well-paying and, uh, and ultimately together will impact human health. So that's, that's the vision. Um, five years, five to 10 years, I think that is what we'd love to do. Talking about uh, Kendall Square, of course, that, that is in Cambridge. It's a, a bustling area where MIT, Harvard, uh, Boston University, Northeastern, uh, a lot of the schools come together and have created a critical mass of students and, and ingenuity and research and certainly venture capital dollars. So that is really an amazing goal and it's one that we would um, you know, readily aspire to and we already are, in fact, I think uh, significantly down the road in terms of carving out our own identity in mm. Providence in the Joey District and in other places to complement, you know, really what is going on up the road a piece. It's only 50 mm. miles. So I'm wondering if you see any potential for synergy collaboration um, with our regional neighbors and partners. Sure. Yeah. So I and I and I do think, you know, you've probably heard and yes, your audience uh, has probably read in different uh, uh, avenues that there's there's a need uh, within the Boston area to, to grow. And you can grow westward, obviously, but these industries also want to grow in different directions. And, and I think Providence and Rhode Island offer a great opportunity for, for growth. Um, there's no reason why biotech biopharma should stop at the border of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, so that's one. And, and we can partner with biotech and biopharma and give them uh, uh, an alternative site to set up a uh, shop, if you will. But the other is, you know, we have terrific relationships with um, the institutions that you mentioned in the Boston area. There's UMass as well. And we've already had collaborations 
uh, with some of these institutions in other domains. And I see no reason why um, we could not have a shared New England vision, if you will, uh, for uh, discovery and innovation. And that's something that, you know, we have some thoughts in mind in, in, um, in the area of RNA therapeutics, for example, that I think could be something that the New England area collectively gets together around and advances. One of the aspects um, that Brown is bringing to the table in curing, if you will, is um, this whole notion of we haven't had sufficient wet lab space uh, in Rhode Island to do the kinds of research that we would all like to do. Uh, I think people might be surprised to, to, to know that that was in fact uh, something that was holding us back. So really excited to, to know and to read about and to look forward to the addition of uh, wet lab space and other uh, such classroom space that would really help to accelerate the, you know, the research profile of Rhode Island, but also, you know, truly to bring in additional investors and businesses that want to be located here next to such a, a rich repository of talent. Yeah, I mean, the wet lab space was a remarkable challenge. That's why when I first started and I started March 1, Lori, I was really, uh, if you will, almost obsessively focused with this issue because it was so absolutely fundamental to augmenting research and everything that we've talked about, the, you know, the economic benefit and, and opportunities that would come with it. And we, we, we have research space, obviously, in the university. We have research space with our colleagues in the health systems, Lifespan and Care New England. But we need more, and we need to work as a community. And so this new space is space that, um, of course, Brown is investing in but it will be an opportunity for scientists and physician scientists that might work at Brown, they might work at Lifespan, they might work at Care New England, but if their research aligns with the areas of focus within this integrated life sciences building, it's an opportunity for all of us to work together. And we need more space. We also, you know, we've got a certain number of investigators, but we need to grow the pool of researchers. And so this space offers that for us as a community, not just for Brown, but for the entire biomedical ecosystem. We only have a couple of minutes left, Dr. Jane, but I did want to get into another really important issue that affects uh, the healthcare community and the research and university community in Providence. And that is uh, what we witnessed a couple of uh, months ago with the um, the consolidation, the proposed consolidation between Lifespan and Care New England, and that consolidation did not come to fruition. Wondering uh, what your thoughts are as uh, the leader of the medical school, and have there been any developments in the last six weeks or so that would give you any hope for additional and future collaboration? Yeah, so uh, the, you know, the, the merger, um, the the much anticipated merger, uh, as you noted, uh, did not go through. That actually happened the week before I started. So probably like a lot of Rhode Islanders, I was a bit disappointed. But I, I, I want to tell you that I think sometimes when something challenging like that occurs, there's a silver lining. And in my now nearly six months, I would say the engagements with the leadership from the boards, the CEOs, the board chairs, of the two health systems uh, with the medical school and the university have been incredibly positive and incredibly robust. And while we cannot integrate the health systems, we are working to integrate research across the, the, the institutions, which I think is really positive and you know, speaks powerfully to what we can all achieve together in the future. So again, I only have a, the experience of six months, um, but what everyone says who's been here longer than me is that they are really, really excited about how we are all working together. There's a, a level of camaraderie, trust, and shared vision that um, perhaps hasn't quite been there before, but it's really exciting to see it come, uh, come to, um, to be and to come to fruition uh, as we move forward. 
So uh, I think what you're saying is that um, some of the benefits of consolidation around, you know, informal levels of collaboration, perhaps, you know, short of something um, formal and, um, you know, totally strategic starting to take shape and perhaps leading us in a direction um, where there may be some room for, you know, additional thinking through of this notion of, you know, how to really become um, a place or an instant, a set of institutions that has the financial stability and the ability to recruit in and to, uh, you know, be a force in today's very, very, um, you know, financially strained healthcare environment, not just here, but all across the country, right? Yep, the challenges that we face are not unique to our community. Uh, they're faced everywhere, so you're absolutely correct. What I think has really emerged in the dialogue that I've had with the leaders of both institutions, and we've had a lot of discussions, is that we have a shared vision. The North Star is that we want to succeed as a biomedical ecosystem, and we want to succeed for the citizens of Rhode Island and the benefit um, uh, of uh, humanity broadly. And in order to do that, we have to work together because together we are much stronger than the individual components. And I know that sounds a little bit like mom and apple pie, but it's really, really important to always keep that North Star in mind that we are one community and our impact will be greatest locally and beyond if we work together. And I think that principle is really shared very much by the leadership of all the major uh, biomedical ecosystem entities. And I think as long as we keep our eye on the prize, keep our eye on that North Star, we're going to be just fine. As we wrap up, uh, Dr. Jane, I want to give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, maybe tell us about some enjoyment that you've had in the city, some unexpected uh, pleasures or places that you've seen. Uh, restaurants that you've gone to, attractions, arts, uh, something that has enchanted you. Yeah, so I, I would say just a couple of things, Lori, thanks for that uh, question. One is uh, having never lived in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, is I've really enjoyed the opportunity to be able to walk uh, more than I've done ever before. So everything is, is within a walking distance or a short ride, which is really fabulous. Number two, the warmth of the people. Um, I've been very blessed to have really uh, fabulous colleagues that have supported, supported me within Brown, but I would extend that now over the six months having you know, ventured out to in, in all uh, types of areas and domains, um, just the warmth and, and the, um, uh, you know, the, the embrace that I've received from the community broadly. So I, I wanna thank everybody for that. I don't want to say about a, a favorite restaurant. I, I will tell you what I've been amazed by is I had no idea how many restaurants there were in Providence and and just small, cute places and, and the quality of food and the experience is just fantastic. So, um, you know, we're, we're my family and I were still uh, learning uh, the, the, the community, but it seems to me everywhere we go, we have a great time. And then finally, I'll give a, um, I experienced my first water fire a, a couple of weekends ago. And that was quite an experience having, having never uh, appreciated one. And I'm gonna use this opportunity, Lori, to just put a plug in for a really special water fire that Brown University and the medical school will be sponsoring on October 22nd. Um, it is part of our 50 year celebration. It's one of our anchor events and it's an effort to really engage and thank the community that we serve. So that's Water Fire, October 22nd. But that, those are some of the, the personal uh, reflections uh, so far, and, and they've all been honestly just really fabulous. Well, um, you have a twinkle in your eye when you talk about um, what you've been doing, it brings a smile to your face. I love the way you call it, sweet, cute places. That is really... I think that, no, you said small, cute places. I love yeah. that. Small, cute. I would add authentic on top of that. Absolutely, a lot yeah. Of the, uh, a lot of the restaurants, um, you know, really have cropped up as a result of, you know, the great culinary traditions that we have here, all kinds of, you know, 
ethnic foods and you know you name it you can find it here and it's all world class in terms of uh, culinary adventure here in Providence and the arts as well I'm sure you found that right yeah, absolutely well fantastic so um, we've covered a lot of ground today we've talked about the uh, the 50th anniversary of the medical school and the water fire that's coming up on October 22nd we've talked about the great planned investment in the jewelry district. We've talked about the, the differing types of students that are entering the medical profession today and the different ways that they are looking at medicine and holistic uh, treatment. We've talked about research and diseases of the brain and mental health and a whole host of issues. Uh, so we are incredibly thankful to you, Dr. Jane, for bringing your talents here uh, to Providence to help lead our institutions and hopefully um, develop even more ways in which our, our great universities, colleges, and hospitals can come together and unite and really, um, really put a stake in the ground in terms of real, true, advanced thinking around uh, the academic medical research uh, collaborative. So. With that, um, any parting words, anything you'd like to leave us with in terms of uh, thinking through next steps and what you're feeling upbeat about? I, I would say, look, it, it really is um, a, a pleasure and a pl privilege to be here. And I am just excited about all the things. Uh, it's amazing how much, uh, as, you, as you summarize it, how much uh, ground we've covered today. But I think what I would just leave with is that uh, it's an incredible community. Uh, the community is, is coming together around a shared vision, and that's really, really exciting. And that shared vision uh, will, will hopefully not only um, uh, impact the, the health of, of the community and beyond, but it'll also help uh, uh, advance the, the economic efforts uh, and, and strength of the community. And so it's just a really exciting time uh, to be here and to be part of this effort. Well, that was very beautifully said, and uh, you know that you have uh, an open door anytime you want to come back and chat with us or bring issues or concerns or, you know, celebrate uh, special moments. We would love to continue to talk with you in places like this and also in person and be able to continue to introduce you to a lot of the wonderful folks that are associated with uh, the Greater Providence Chamber. And um, we thank you for being with us today. We thank your colleagues for helping to make today possible. And uh, we're going to see you on October 22nd, if not sooner. So thanks again. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks very much, Laurie.